Hey everyone, how's it going? It's Anthony Cazenza with the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. I hope you are all doing well. We're coming at you live on a special Thursday edition of the program. We hope we're not interrupting too much football watching for you this evening. Uh, the Raiders are taking on the Chiefs tonight in a big AFC West match, so uh, should be a fun one there. But I am joined by my co-host Scott Schultz to talk about the Bengals and their huge, their own huge divisional matchup with the Steelers. And uh, Scott, how are you, sir? Doing pretty good. I got to uh, watch a CSX engine unload some hopper cars at lunch, so it was an exciting day. Awesome, awesome. And and as you can hear, probably who's whoever's tuning in can hear. I've got a, a very happy child in the background and. Uh, you know, that might be a theme for uh, the show. I apologize, but uh, I'm kind of flying solo and doing a number of different things tonight for those of you tuning in. Uh, Scott, you know, where to begin, I guess, with this one? We've seen some good things and bad things from both the Bengals and the Steelers this year. Does this uh, obviously this is kind of the time of year when certain certain teams have certain records and what does it mean you know is or does that mean they're, they're going to be a contender towards the end of the year or are they kind of pretending at this moment in time the Steelers lose to the Bears but they beat the undefeated Chiefs so does this one right now you know as we sit here kind of inching towards the middle of the season does this one right now is it going to prove this this first go round? Is it going to prove if the Bengals and or Steelers are con contenders or pretenders, regardless of the result for either team? I think it pretty much has to because I mean, for several reasons. One reason is if the Bengals lose, you're now two and four. Pittsburgh's five and two. Yeah, Baltimore's in there between the two of you. You know, you're a game and a half back of the leader. You don't have the tiebreaker. You know, at that point. I mean, your season's not over, but you are in a heck of a t difficult spot. And you're know, coming off the bye week, coming off the win against Buffalo, you know, coming off the win in Cleveland, almost winning in Green Bay. It looks like they're turning things around. And each week you get a better test. You, you know, you almost won at Green Bay. You know, Aaron Rodgers was Aaron Rodgers. And apparently he's not going to be Aaron Rodgers again for the rest of the year. But when he was, that was, you know, obviously just, you know, him doing his thing, and they came so close to winning that one. They destroyed the Browns, which grants the Browns. They get a decent test at home in the torrential downpour against the Bills. They beat the Bills. They get the bye week, week repair. So, okay, what, what can you do? And granted, Marvin isn't great coming off a of bye week, but this is really his opportunity to, you know, this is to see, okay, is this team, you know, for real, are they going to be a two, a three and three team that's back in the hunt, started 0 and 3? You've turned things around, you figured out the offense. Either we're going to see that. Or we're going to see they're two and four. They lost the divisional game. They are now, you know, one and two in the division. They're sitting behind Baltimore, behind Pittsburgh, with the tiebreaker going against them, against both of those teams. So for them, it's a huge game. I think for Pittsburgh, it is too, because you know Pittsburgh, you're going to see a lot. Pittsburgh, you know, someone who, you know, just came off the, a road victory at Kansas City, which very few people saw. I mean, Kansas City has been beating everyone. Un the last undefeated team. But, you know, Pittsburgh just lost the you – know, got blown out by Jacksonville the week before and got beat in Chicago <laughs> two weeks before that. So they're, they've been all over the map, and they almost got beat in Cleveland. Uh, but if they win, you know, then all of a sudden they're 5-2, and two, and, you know, they have that big lead over the Bengals, you know, one and a half games up. They have the tiebreaker. So, yeah, I, I think it's definitely going to be a big game that really kind of, you know, lays out, okay, the final – 10, you know, eight, nine weeks, 10 weeks of the season, because at this point you are in that situation where, you know, you really can't afford to be that many games back because some of the issues you have, you know, that have made you where you're at two and three, they aren't really going away. You, I mean, you can't scheme, you can't coach up or do enough to fix the fact you just don't have, you know, a ton of great offensive linemen on that team. You can do a little you just can't do as much as you need to do to resolve that. So, you know, you're in a situation where you are, where you're at that, yeah, you just, I mean, if you don't win the game, you're, you're pretty much defining your season for better or worse. I agree. Um, 
it, it's these divisional matchups are always so important, and the Bengals have had such a lack of success with the Steelers under Marvin Lewis. I mean, they've done a good job with the Browns. They've done a good job with uh, the Ravens for the most part. Um, but it's the Steelers that are always the thorn in the side, and usually the Steelers are up there almost every year either getting a wild card or getting the AFC North division. So, you know, it's this one's important, and I think, as you mentioned, we started to see them turn the corner against Green Bay from the start of the season. Now all of a sudden they're coming off two wins. They're coming off of a bye. Yes, Tyler Eifert is done for the year. Yes, John Ross looks like he may not play once again this week. But the Bengals seem to be doing things. Uh, they seem to be cleaning a lot of things up. Now, I still think there are some issues, particularly on offense. And uh, in terms of getting touchdowns, in terms of the running game, blocking, all of that kind of stuff. But I also think that there are some issues on defense in terms of getting turnovers. And I think that's going to be huge this week against the Steelers. We're going to talk more about the, the previewing the Steelers game in just a few minutes. This is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. I'm Anthony Cazenza, joined by Scott Schultze. And you can find this program on iTunes, on SoundCloud, on YouTube, on CincyJungle.com. Uh, you could get in touch with us at Bengals OBI on Twitter or via email, the OB Insider at gmail.com with any questions, comments, anything you want to address with us. We're also taking some listener questions at the end of this program, time permitting. So we will uh, try to leave those in the YouTube chat, leave those live at cincyjungle.com, and we will try and get to those at the end of this program. Scott? You know, there, there's a lot of Bengals fans who maybe didn't watch too much football last week because the Bengals had the week off. And usually when they do, that means you can actually do something productive with your weekend. But if you if you did watch that big game with the Steelers and the Chiefs, which a lot of people did, you would have seen a, an incredibly cheap shot by Mike Mitchell the safety for the Pittsburgh Steelers on Alex Smith. Alex Smith released the football and far after he released the football, he, there was a hit that he went very low and uh, hit the, uh, you can hear my, my son isn't, wasn't pleased with the hit either. He hit Alex Smith very low. And unfortunately, you know, well, fortunately he was flagged. He's been fined. He wasn't suspended, but the, he's been a repeat offender. Now, between he and Vontez Perfect, there are there's a an argument, and you had this on a Cincy Jungle post you're putting up this week on the Behind Enemy Lines. There's a Cincy Jungle post that says that's talking about who's a more cheap shot kind of guy, Vontez Perfect or Mike Mitchell. Who? How did that conversation go? And obviously, we want to talk about our our feelings on this as well. Yeah, we do a post, as you mentioned, on Cincy Jungle every week, which is a behind enemy lines where we reach out to the SB Nation blog writers, editors from the other site, and then we will throw five questions their way, and then usually they will do the same thing, asking us five questions. So one of the questions we asked this week is because obviously two of the most notorious players who are kind of considered dirt, dirty, cheap shot, you know, whatever, are playing the Sunday against each other. Vontez Burfick, the linebacker for the Bengals, and Mike Mitchell, who is the safety for Pittsburgh Steelers. And both of them have had uh, a litany of hits you can, and, you know, kind of beyond the lines, you know, a bit too excessive. And so the question is, okay, you ask the you know, folks at the Steelers site behind the steel curtain, who is, you know, who is the dirtier player? And, yeah, as you would expect, you know, obviously anyone who's Bengals fan is probably going to say, well, clearly it's Mike Mitchell. Anyone who is a Steelers fan is going to say, well, clearly it's Fonta's perfect. And uh, we spoke to Jeff Hartman, who is the editor over there. And uh, true to form, he obviously said that he thought uh, Vontez perfect was the dirtier player. And it was kind of interesting. The The reason he gave uh, was something that I think makes sense. It's 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 an argument that can be made. Uh, and it was essentially, and uh, if you read the post, obviously you'll get a little more depth. But essentially his argument was, well, you know, if you look at it from an outsider's perspective, 
the league has come down heavier on perfect. He's received more suspensions, more fines. So you could argue he is. And of course, you know, obviously the counter to that as well, you know, is because the league is fining him more, suspending him more. It doesn't mean he's a dirtier player. You, you would almost have to look at each quote unquote dirty hit, dirty play, you know, cheap shot, whatever, and just kind of line them up and say, okay, here's the ones that perfect has done that have been, uh, you know, calls suspensions or fines or flags. Here's the ones that Mitchell has done, you know, and just kind of compare them side by side and see who is the dirtier player. Uh, for my money, I would say it's got to be Mitchell. And the reason I would say that is outside of the ankle twisting thing that Burfick did with Cam Newton a couple years ago, which I, I still don't really have a good explanation for that other than, yeah, that was just – no, yeah, there's no excuse for that. Outside of that, most of Burfick's hits just seem to be – I am a you know tough SOB, old school, you know, knock the – you know totally knock the daylights out of you, deplete you, play, you know, up through the whistle, just, you know, play 100%, full aggressive all the time, you know, full speed, you know, really doesn't have a, a gear other than all out or nothing. And so that's, you know, what Burfick seems to do. And the league co- tends to come after him because, you know, it's more of a politically correct, you know, we want to divorce ourselves from concussions. We don't want to celebrate those hits that are too big. And Burfick seems to be caught up in that. Mitchell, on the other hand, he just looks like he's out to kill people. I mean, he just looks like he's, you know, d- deliberately headhunting, you know, going for knees, just total cheap shot. He may not be a big hitter like Burfick, but just seems to go for the more injurious kind of hits. And uh, I don't know. I'd, I'd say that's that's my three cents. Is is injurious a new word? Is that a is that a new word there, Scott? I, I like that one. Unless I, I think so. You my, say that. My wife has told me that I've I use some words that are apparently are not uh, <laughs> legit turned for instead of turned and learnt instead of learned and apparently yep. if you look at an old enough yep. dictionary learnt is in there so I have won that battle learnt learnt is a word yeah I believe learnt learnt is a word from what I understand so um, yeah you know I, I don't think you're off base there but anyway <laughs> I, I I see what you're saying with both guys uh, you know with with perfect it's more kind of walking the line a, a bit for me and unfortunately there's been this narrative of you know he's he's this dirty guy and he's you know he, he had did the, the problem is with perfect is he has done more of this stuff in college and it followed him to the NFL whereas Mike Mitchell didn't have that college reputation didn't he did not have that college reputation and uh, now it's it's following him to the NFL and a lot of people are getting mad at him. And obviously, obviously I'm having a hard time guys. I'm flying solo with tonight. Um, obviously it's taken, a, it's taken a toll on the Bengals. And obviously Mike Mitchell, when I see, when I see Mike Mitchell play and unfortunately a Bengals fans know this play. When I see Mike Mitchell play, especially against the Bengals, I see not even an attempt really with arms to wrap up people a lot of times. It's almost like arms to the side leading with the head and the arms are all the way down the side. So that to me is uh, a sign of some some really questionable hits on his part. I think obviously there's a bias that, uh, you know, Mike Mitchell is a dirty player, especially in Bengals fans' eyes. And of course, the Steelers would say the opposite. Steelers fans would st- say the opposite. To me, it's very close, but I think because of Burfick's college track record, because of his his other offenses in the NFL so far, I think that he has he has kind of gained this reputation, whereas Mike Mitchell has quietly maybe it's because of the Steelers favoritism or what have you, he hasn't quite gained that education yet. So um, I, I don't know. I, I think it's an interesting discussion though. And uh, was it, was he, was, was he even questioning? Uh, not not too much. He just basically was looking at the, uh, I, it, he took a very, uh, trying to do the right word, very safe approach and just said, well, you know, if I was an outsider, here's how I'd look at it. 
just 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 purely looking at the way the NFL rates it, which is kind of like asking someone, hey, should you know, is it okay to smoke crack? And well, is it legal or not? If it's legal, it's good. Illegal, bad. Which okay, it's an argument. It's not the greatest argument. The argument is, well, what what do you think? I don't care if it's legal. I'm asking your opinion. Um, and I think you ask it. I mean, you ask any Steelers fan. I think they're clearly going to say, uh, you know, the guy in their uniform. I mean, we all do that. I mean, the guy in our uniform is clearly the better player. The guy in the opposing uniform is clearly an inferior player, unless the guy who's wearing the Bengals jersey is just totally horrible. Uh, you know, we're generally going to think they're better. I mean, that's why whenever you you know you talk about, I mean, you see in fantasy football, we brought up fantasy football for you know it's so hard for people to make trades because they always view the guy on their roster as twice as good as he is, and the guy on the other roster they're trading for is total garbage. And that's why whenever you talk about someone making a trade, you know, we have all the many fans like, oh, we're going to trade McCarron for a first round pick. Well, no one's going to give you a first round pick for McCarron. And conversely, if you were on another team, let's say you were on the Jaguars and you need a quarterback. You know, none of those fans are going to say we're going to give a first round pick. They're, those fans would probably think, oh, we'll give a conditional sixth or seventh for him. And obviously the you know, the line is somewhere in the middle. And I think you get that with the Burfick Mitchell thing, you know, who is the dirtier player? And it's I'm I think when an argument can be made so strong either way, the answer is probably both. If you just really wanted to get down to it and look at okay, you know, the track record of what they've done, what they've been suspended for, they haven't been suspended for, you know, the clips obviously if you go to the Cincy Jungle site, you can find pen, plenty of posts and articles highlighting all the Mike Mitchell clips and some of the other Pittsburgh Steeler clips where they seem to be head hunting and targeting heads, targeting knees, targeting you know players well after the play. And obviously the playoff game from a couple years ago is a clear example of that with coaches running on the field, coaches yanking, you know, Reggie Nelson's hair, all the other things that happened in that game. And then, you know, you kind of have the same thing. Yeah, I'm sure if you were a Steelers fan, you could look at all the things that um uh, Vons has perfect done. You can look at, you know, where he was twisting the ankles, which of course is funny because you never really hear them mentioning when Ben Roethlisberger was just doing that a couple weeks ago. But of course you'll you'll hear about Vons has perfect when he did that. It's apparently it's okay when uh your guy and it's like it's, it's fine when your guy does it, it's when the other person does it that it's not okay. And that's kind of the thing that you run into is since an a strong argument can be made either way. It's one of those things like, uh, you know, what's better, high taxes or low taxes? Well, I don't know, maybe middle, because if you can make a strong argument either way, you're not, you're never really going to come up with a winner. Uh, I think the best winner we can say is obviously Burfick's a better player, because as long as he's in the Bengal uniform, I think I, I'll just conclude that as long as Burfick's wearing a Bengals uniform, clearly Mitchell's the, the worst player. Yeah, and I mean, if you've seen questionable hits by him against uh, by Mitchell on Eifert, on AJ Green, and uh, you know, very head hunting type of type of hits, and um, unfortunately, it's just kind of the ammo with both of those guys, and it's going to be interesting to see if either of them kind of um, don't have incidents this Sunday. Hopefully, they don't, and hopefully, it doesn't cause injuries. But it's an interesting, obviously, an interesting argument to kind of say. And obviously, there's a bit the Bengals slant is, oh, Mike Mitchell's obviously the dirtier player. Um, but it's just uh, kind of kind of interesting. You know, I mean, they both have their kind of enforcers on defense, both teams, and uh, both will be suiting up this Sunday uh, as Mike Mitchell was not was not suspended for this hit on Alex Smith that I thought was pretty, pretty awful. Uh, moving on, Scott. This, the Bengals, as we know, are taking it's Steelers week. They're taking on uh, Pittsburgh, and it's a biggie. They're coming off a bye. The Bengals, uh, I believe, I read are two, two and one or three and one off of the bye under Marvin Lewis against the Steelers. So that's kind of a good sign, and and it's kind of interesting because the Bengals, I think, only have eight or nine wins total against the Steelers in the Marvin Lewis era. So. Um, one thing bodes well for him and the overall history doesn't bode well for him. Um, you can kind of say, you know, Hey, there's, there's kind of the, the key to win is who can ground and pound, right? This is always kind of a physical game and it's always physical playing the Steelers. Who's going to out physical each other is kind of the, the question always um, when it comes to this series 
there are other keys to win. I want to hear a couple of yours, and then I want to ask you another question about the importance of the offense versus the defense. But give me a couple of keys for the Bengals in order to win this game because both teams have been a bit Jekyll and Hyde this year so far. I'd say two. if I gave one offensively and one defense, I'll give three. I'll give uh, offense, defense, and then neither. Offense has got to be the offensive line. Pittsburgh's front seven has been playing very well. They've been very good pass rushing. If you can give your quarterback time, their de- secondary seems to be uh, a defense you can probably move the ball against, but you have to have time. And their front seven has been very good. I think they're, as far as pressures and sacks, they're one of the – Higher teams in the NFL right now, they've done a good job in doing that. Granted, they haven't exactly been facing the greatest quarterbacks in the world. They've been facing, you know, Mike Glennon, and they've been facing, uh, you know, Deshaun Kaiser. And you look at their schedule, you know, Blake Bortles, they obviously have had some of the, you know, they're not exactly going up against Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, you know, so forth. But their front seven's still been very good. So if you're going to beat them, you have to keep Andy Dalton upright. You have to give them time to throw the ball. You have to give these receivers time to get open. So clearly the offensive line, I think, which has been, you know, the the big make or break thing for the offense all season has got to step up. They've got to play well. You know, the Bengals have got to get their five best players in there. If it's Andre Smith, the boy, he, you know, whoever, whoever it is, they've got to get those guys, you know, do it out there doing, you know, doing their job, doing it well. Defensively, I think the big play, you know, the big, key has got to be the pass rush. You know, the, the Steelers obviously like to go vertical. They like to go, you know, pass the ball to Antonio Bryant, uh, Antonio Brown. Martavis Bryant has burned us in the past, and then they have some other guys who can catch the ball, including Le'Veon Bell, who is a very good receiver out of the backfield as well as a runner. So we have to get the pass rush. And, of course, the big thing is with Ben Roethlisberger, he's big, Ben, because some guys bounce off him. So the guys like Willis and Lawson, you know, we have this good pass rush. And we've got to be able to get to him and actually get him down on the ground. And I think that's something we can do. So I think defensively, that I'd say the key is the pass rush getting and not just pressuring him, but actually knocking him down. And then, you know, getting him knocked on the ground, getting him sat, getting him where, you know, he, it, the game just becomes a, a nuisance and a pain for him, where you're just constantly, you know, Lawson and Atkins and Dunlap are just all over him. And then the third thing I'm going to give. So my three keys would be one on offense, one defense. The other one would be the field because I'm expecting this to be a very close, very ugly back and forth, you know, turnover, bad call kind of thing wins the game because both offense, both defenses are really grinding it out. And that field is notorious Heinz field for not being a field goal kicker's paradise. It's kind of, it can get very ugly and choppy at times. So if it comes down to, you know, winning by a field goal, either by Boswell or Randy Bullock, hopefully the field is in a good enough shape that, you know, if our guy's kicking, we can make the kick. And hopefully, you know, the field is deteriorated enough that if their guy's kicking, he isn't able to make it. So that's it. Those are my three keys. Offensive line, defensive pass rush, and that thing they call football field. <laughs> exactly. And interesting statistics, Scott. You know, you mentioned the Bengals' pass rush. Top two teams in sacks generated so far. Uh, let me let me see here. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I misread. But the Pittsburgh Steelers are in a three-way tie for second in the NFL with 20 sacks. And the Bengals are right behind them with 18 total sacks. So, uh, and that that's good for them uh, to to have the number five ranking there, essentially. So they're but they're right right next to each other. It's essentially for, uh, number four and number five if you want to look at it that way. So very close matchup there. And I would think based on the offensive lines, the Steelers have a little bit of an edge there, just based on the struggles that the Bengals' offensive line has had. Getting some of these running backs going is going to be a big thing. Joe Mixon getting, I believe, 2.8 yards per carry so far this year. That's not getting it done. Obviously not all on him. But he's, you know, he's got to he's got to create a big play if he can, as Giovanni Bernard has uh so far this year. So I think that's that's going to that's going to be a big key. And you know, Eliminating the those frustrating Andy Dalton, Pittsburgh Steelers type of interceptions. Those ones where he sails one high after getting hit a couple of times. 
you know, across the middle. Now, again, no, no Tyler Eifert, probably no John Ross. So that's going to affect the offense in a big way. So you got to balance too, not having those guys and, and still being able to stretch the field and not just do these short controlled passing games that later in the game become predictable. So uh, I, I think that I, I think that Andy Dalton not turning the ball over obviously is a big key, and he has done that quite a few times against the Steelers in a frustrating fashion and in critical points of the games. So I think that's going to be a, a big key for me. Now, Scott, I want to ask you, do you think – that the Bengals for, – for Cincinnati against the Steelers this week, do you think that their offense playing better against Pittsburgh is more important or their defense playing better against Pittsburgh is more important? Because you look at it, and like I said, the Bengals have some good weapons on offense, but their offensive line has been struggling. And – they haven't been running the ball that well. I'll say it for the third time tonight. No Eifert, no Ross. Obviously, A.J. Green has been a good weapon against Pittsburgh, but he's going up against a guy who, for a time, had some good games against him in Joe Hayden. So, is it more important for the Bengals to kind of score points and maybe bend a little bit more on defense? Or is it, you know, really play it close defense special teams try and ground out yards and tough points i'm going to go against what i should probably say and i'm going to go with the offense stepping up and the reason i'm going to say that is i think our defense is all i think our defense is playing great this year and even if they don't have their greatest game they're still a very good defense you look at an interesting t- statistic the steelers on offense passing the ball are averaging about 6.3 net yards per attempt the but only giving up 4.4 the Bengals are averaging about 6.5 net yards per attempt also only given at 4.4 so both defense have been playing great you mentioned the sack numbers the Bengals have 18 sacks the Steelers have 20 sacks the Bengals have done that one less game so our sacks per game are a higher number and the other interesting is you look at the teams we've played the Bengals have done that you know against better quarterbacks you know Steelers have gone up against Case Keenum uh, I guess we obviously both went up against Deshaun Kaiser. Uh, we went up against uh, Deshaun Watson, who is now kind of broken out and throwing a million touchdowns and just seems to be able to all everything. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, who's obviously great. Joe Flacco, who is adequate, but uh, you know they, as opposed to some of the guys the Steelers have gone up against, like uh, Mike Glennon, uh, Case Keenum, Deshaun Kaiser, also Flacco, Bortles. So I'd say, you know, we've played equal or better a competition, especially throwing Aaron Rodgers out there who is kind of in a world above all those other folks. Despite doing that, we are holding our own against teams. So I think the defense is already doing well. The offense is a thing that really has struggled so far this year. They've had good moments, bad moments, obviously, you know, putting 31 against the Browns is a good moment. Putting 24 against Packers was good, except if you look at that, only two offensive touchdowns, and those were on the first three drives of the game, and they went flat after that. The Bills, you know, getting the 20 points against the Bills was a solid effort, especially in that torrential downpour. And then, But then, of course, when you're in a game like that, it just kind of makes you wonder, okay, how much is it is, you know, is it just, you know, both defenses and offenses kind of playing sloppy and teams dropping the ball and dropping interceptions. And so it's kind of hard to get a good gauge when the conditions are just that bad on the field that you just really can't tell what's happening uh, but the offense I think is one needs to step up because the Steelers defense is also playing really well and I think even if our defense doesn't play it's a game they should be able to do fairly decent so we're going and, and also we need to see the offense do well not just because of this game but for the rest of the season because this is you know your past your bye week you've had four you know, four weeks now with the new offensive coordinator, three games and a bye week. So you've had a month to kind of instill whatever little tweaks or changes he's going to do. So you've kind of got that one for you. And then you've really got to see, okay, you know, we've got Bill Lazor in here. We've had our month. We have our offensive weapons. Obviously, we probably won't have John Ross again. We are now at Tyler Eifert for the year, but we've kind of been without him for most of the year. So not a 
I mean, it's a loss, but not a huge surprise, just because he has missed more games than he's played in his career. And so you just – so you have to see, you know, what is this offense going to be able to do? We're in a – you know, it's, it's not a torrential downpour. It's not a horrible team like the Browns. It's a – Solid team. We have to see, can this offense move the ball? Can they make adjustments? Can they adjust to a good defense like the Steelers? Can they provide any sort of pass protection? Can they provide some sort of hole so Joe Mixon isn't getting tackled every time he gets the ball? And I think going into the Bills game, Joe Mixon had been tackled on something like 24% of his rushes. He was tackled for a loss, which means essentially as soon as he's getting the ball, he's being tackled and there's not even enough running room for him to get back to the line of scrimmage. That's not a very good statistic. Uh, if you compare that to league averages and some of the better players in the league, obviously that's a very low number. It's a you know, 24% I think it's a very high number, very, very bad number. And so you look at, you know, these the Bengals yards per carry averages, and they're really down there. And the reason is because they they just aren't getting a lot of room to make the ball or to make any runs when they get the ball. And we talk about, well, obviously when Joe Mixon was drafted, the big hype was when well, he can make Peel miss, he can create. Well, you can, and the unfortunate thing is he's creating to get from negative to like two and a half or two point eight yards a carry. And the frustrating thing is, if he had any sort of line, yeah, you know, that would be he'd be creating to get from you know instead of getting touched three yards behind the line of scrimmage, if he's getting touched three yards ahead of the line of scrimmage, then maybe he's turning that three into four, five, six yards a carry. So I guess for those reasons, I'd have to go with offense. I'm kind of with you. I'm kind of with you. Uh, I look. I look at it, and I think the defense. I mean, again, this question is is more about you know if you had to choose one or the other, not necessarily. Well, we can rely on the defense playing pretty well because they've done so all year. But if you had to choose, the Bengals scoring points would be. Kind of, kind of a big thing because that would mean that the Steelers' defense isn't getting to Andy Dalton, isn't creating turnovers in all likelihood, which is a big deal. And then they're getting into the end zone. They're fixing some red zone issues. All of, all of that, uh, all of that stuff. So I, I tend to agree with you. I'm looking in the, the live YouTube chat. Uh, you look at it and you. St- uh, Austin Tran says our defense needs to know how to cover Antonio Brown. And Chris Brug says offense can't turn the ball over three times and expect to beat the Steelers for sure. So uh, it's kind of kind of a conflicting argument. I think both you and I are on the same page, though, about that offense. It's uh, they they need to they need to they need to score points. And uh, uh, there's too many times. In this series, we've seen the Bengals squeak one out, I think, a couple of years ago when Vontez Perfect was suspended. Uh, he came back, and then they, they squeaked one out 13-7 to seven or something to that effect. That usually just is not going to happen, especially against this Pittsburgh offense. Antonio Brown's having a great year, much like A.J. Green is. They've got Le'Veon Bell. They've got Jesse James. They've got a decent offensive line. They've got Big Ben. I'm I'm glad that the Bengals are kind of catching them after such a big emotional game against the Chiefs, where they beat a five and O team, and maybe they they hit the brakes a little bit uh, because going into this week. But we'll see. Uh, again, the Bengals uh, are, are going into Pittsburgh and they're playing a tough team. I think the offense needs you got to score points to win, and I think that that is kind of that's, that's kind of where we're at, right? Yeah, and I think another reason why, and uh, I just pulled up some statistics looking at as far as our defense stopping those players, even if they don't have a great game, we've done a pretty good job of stopping guys like Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell. Uh, in 2014, Le'Veon Bell, base, he averaged like 120-some yards against us each game. Since then, we've held him to 47 yards and a touchdown, 87 yards, no touchdown, 39 yards, no touchdown. 58 yards, no touchdown. So we seem to have been doing a decent job focusing on him, although usually that comes to the detriment of, okay, we got him covered, but we're giving up a touchdown to Heath Miller or Jesse James or to Martavis Bryant. But we seem to be doing a decent job of shutting Brown. Le'Veon Bell has kind of been the same thing. 
uh, in 2015, it was 45 yards and no scores. Uh, 2016, he had one game against us. It was like 90 yards and no scores. Obviously, he hasn't played any this year. In 2014, the last game of the year, he had 20 yards and no scores. And we will just ignore the first game they played in 2014 because that kind of goes the other way. The other thing I think goes in the Bengals' favor is we – in – Pittsburgh. If you look at Marvin Lewis against the Steelers, we're something like oh and you know oh and everything. We he has never beaten the Pittsburgh Steelers in Cincinnati, if I'm not mistaken. But we uh, have almost have a 500 record against them in Pittsburgh. So if we're going to win one for whatever reason, as weird as it seems, that seems to be when we do well against the Steelers is in Pittsburgh. And I don't know if the players get up more for it or the Pittsburgh Steel team just kind of takes it for granted because, oh, it's a home game, we're going to win. But for whatever reason, we you know, the defense has seemed to do a decent job against these guys, and I think the defense this year is even better. So if I have to pick one unit to step up from how they're playing this year, I think it's got to be the offense. Yeah. Of course, also, the, the uh, special teams are players too, you know. And the Bengals have actually had a pretty good year on special teams, much better than last so far, knock on wood. Randy Bullock did miss a big kick against the Packers, but has been perfect on everything since, which is a stark contrast to Mike Nugent last year. Kevin Huber has been great at pinning teams inside the 20, and the Bengals have had a, a few nice returns by both Adam Jones and Alex Erickson. So that is is that's also a, a very important aspect. But when you look at these two teams, obviously their respective offenses and defenses are, are their really their strengths of their team. And you got to look at both of those units as really where the Bengals may or may not win the, win the game here. And Michael Myers in uh, by the way, and it's, it's a very festive name. I, I feel bad every time we mention Michael Myers, a, a show regular, we always talk about the movie Halloween, but it's getting festive now, given that the holiday is coming up around the corner. So glad he could join us, but he does bring up the same point you brought up, Scott, the Steelers own us at home, but play well, but we play well in Pittsburgh is what he said. Um, James Napke need, need perfect to gator roll Le'Veon Bell again. Well, I, I, I don't know if we need that. Uh, and uh, Mohammed Alumair says, uh, if we could stop Bell, we might be able to win. Ben's been playing so bad lately, and he turns to Bell. Yeah, that's a great point, too, because Le'Veon Bell is a guy that it, it just – Yes, he's a great runner. He's a patient runner. He waits for things to open up, but he's also a very, very good outlet for Ben Roethlisberger in the passing game. So uh, obviously if the Bengals kind of uh, get, you know, if they can control the trifecta there of, of Ben and Antonio Brown and Bell, uh, there is, there's a solid, solid chance that they can win this game. We do have, uh, a couple of questions, I believe we are going to take a, a couple of more. So if you're joining us live in the YouTube chat, please leave those. If you have Bengals questions as they come off of the bye week. And if you have uh, if, if you have any other comments or anything, we'll, we'll look at those. We're also taking them on Twitter at Bengals OBI and at Cincy Jungle uh, in the live thread there. So please leave them. Scott, we did uh, have one via Twitter I wanted to get to. And it was from Travis Spanky, or, or Spank, one of the two. He writes, two running back sets, how often are they ran in the NFL? If, if Giovanni Bernard is good in pass protection and Mixon runs from shotgun, why aren't we using this? Thoughts, or am I way out to lunch here? For me, Scott, I look at it and I say, and on one hand, it on paper it's a great idea. You know, you get you get essentially your two most expensive. And I, it was one I thought would be a good idea with Geo Geo Bernard and Jeremy Hill there, and just in terms of mind games with opposing defenses. The, the Bengals haven't done it. The, the last time the Bengals really instituted this, 
and they did it at times with James Brooks and Icky Woods. And, and it really, really worked well for them when they did that. They haven't done it since. And because of that, you, you kind of wonder, well, is that something that could play into the effectiveness of this trio of running backs? To me, I think on paper and in terms of creativity and things like that, great idea. I like it. But is it more of kind of a Madden football video game type of thing where it seems like a great idea, but really it's still kind of predictable and you know what's going on? Or uh, your thoughts on this? I, I thought it was a pretty interesting question. I think like anything, it's it's definitely something they could do. And it was funny you mentioned the Icky Woods James Icky Woods James Brooks thing because when you mentioned the two running back sets, that was the first thing that popped in my mind. Unfortunately, that was what thirty years ago, three decades ago. And if you look at football, there obviously there is an evolution in offenses trying to stay a, a step ahead of the defense. So you have you know wishbones and eye formations and all these different things, you know, the two tight end sets, you know, the different personnel alignments, and then the offenses come up with this thing. We're going to do the forward pass. Oh, my goodness, let's run it forward. And then defenses respond. Well, maybe we shouldn't have all 11 guys in the line of scrimmage. Just put a couple guys back a little bit. And then, oh, they spread a flanker out, or, you know, they have two wide receivers out now. And then, you know, defenses adjust. And so I think we've seen that evolution where they did the two running back thing, yeah, it worked for a while in the NFL. Defenses finally figured out how to stop it. And then offensive, you know, they go to different things. You have the run and shoot. The vertical game, the West Coast offense, you have the pistol. You know, teams dabbled in the wildcat for a little bit and the read option. And this, and so it normally happens is, you know, you come up, you try to come up, hopefully you come up with something new and you're not copying because by the time you copy something successful, defenses are starting to adjust to it because that's they're paid, you know, these coordinators are paid to do that. So, but I think this is something that might possibly work. And the reason I'm saying that is it's been so long ago that this was, you know, tried that all the defenses that were, you know, put in place to adjust to it and change it are probably by coordinators who aren't even in the game anymore. They might even be dead if you go back that far. So there's no reason you can't recycle, you know, old strategies until the defenses readjust to it, until these coordinators go watch tape from 30 years ago and say, oh, okay, that's how you stop that. But until they get a chance to do that, I mean, why not? And I'd, you know, I I don't think Marvin Lewis can do this, but I would be a huge fan of saying, let's just reinvent the offense every couple of weeks. If you have enough good skill players and there's and your players are smart enough to learn different styles of play, I mean, not that you have to totally reinvent it, but show you know show the opposing team something they're not prepared for, especially for a bigger game like this where you really need to come away with the win. Hey, let's just go out there and do something crazy like run a two running back set. You know, that's something this Steelers team probably hasn't seen a team do against them, you know, throughout a whole game in quite a long time. And it may take them all game to figure out how to adjust to it. And by then the game's over and you've won. And then, okay, a couple games later, you switch to, I don't know, the run and shoot or something crazy. And obviously I'm just kind of ranting as I'm going on, but I think it, I think there's reasons why they don't do it anymore. I think it would eventually be stopped, but for a very short term gain. I don't see any harm in trying something like that or something crazy like the, I don't know, the, the, the triple option or, you know, fill in the blank, um, you know, for at least a little while. Right. And I, I wouldn't mind it on a, on a minimal basis just to at least say, let's try it out. Let's let, why not? You know, and if, if we could come up with maybe three plays a game where, you get both of those guys in kind of a wishbone package and you fake hand off to one, maybe pitch out to the other. You have, as, as Travis mentioned, you kind of have geo block and then you, you use mixing as an outlet or a, a decoy. I would have no problem with that, especially if it's not something that continuously blows up in their face when they try it. I, I do if we're talking long-term viability and things like that, I mean, you look back to other teams that tried stuff. And if you remember back in gosh, what was it? 08, 09, 2010, the wildcat. And that was a thing that was, that was really difficult to defend for a lot of teams for about a year or two. And then teams kind of caught on, especially when they knew that, uh, that the teams that were running it usually had quarterback limitations in terms of passing. 
So they kind of understood how to they they understood how to guard that. Then it kind of that kind of evolved into something that's kind of the read option thing where Robert Griffin the third, Cam Newton, all of these guys kind of ran that, and it's still there at times, but it's not really what their entire offense is based out of anymore. So. I, my my answer to this is uh, number one. I don't have the statistics of how often that's ran. I don't see it very often. Just from using the eye test, I don't see it very often from teams personally. Even when they have good uh, two or three good running backs on their roster, I have no problem with the Bengals using that. Per- perhaps on a again like a trial basis, at least at first. And, and seeing if they can come up with something that that gets them a big play and and provides a wrinkle, I just don't think that that's something that you know. I, I don't think there's long term sustainability there because we've seen other, I guess, quote unquote, fads in the NFL that come and go. They last for maybe a year, two years, and then they come and go. Now you can make the argument: well, if it works for this year, maybe it gets by with this offensive line and all of that. I understand that, but I think if the Bengals are going to do it, they got to ease into it at this point. This is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. I'm Anthony Cazenza, joined by Scott Schultz. We're going to get out of here in just a few minutes. We're taking some listener questions here at the end of the program. And before we get to another, you can get this program on iTunes, on SoundCloud, on YouTube. Subscribe to those channels. We are reachable at Twitter at Bengals OBI, at, uh, via email, theobinsider at gmail.com, and then all of our content is also on cincyjungle.com. So please check it out. It's Steelers week, so have some fun, and let's hope that the Bengals pull out a big win against Pittsburgh. We got a question, I believe it was, again, from our friend Michael Myers, and it generated some discussion in the live YouTube chat. And it's talking about the Bengals and the trade deadline. I'm gonna I'm gonna dispel the notion of of his second portion of his question, which is talking about Hugh Jackson making a possible trade for McCarron. And I, I think that ship has sailed. I think the the Browns are gonna try and see what they got either out of Deshaun Kaiser or. Kevin Hogan or Cody Kessler, whatever they're doing with the carousel there, I think they probably offered what they offered early. Mike Brown will not trade a player that is even relatively valuable within the division, much less the Cleveland Browns, who his family hates. So I don't think, I think that ship has sailed. But I think there's a possibility that the Bengals, especially if they start winning some games, maybe they start seeing some guys hit the injury bug, all that kind of stuff. They could make a move. It's a rare, rare thing that they do, but we're coming up on the deadline here. Scott, do you see them making a a player trade or is this again, Hey, we're sticking with what we've got. I would be very surprised just because their nature seems to be, we've got our guys, you know, the next man up is the guy on the practice squad. If that doesn't work out, if we're too injured, we just signed someone off the street. I mean, we saw that several years ago when they were in a playoff run and all the receivers got hurt. They signed Greg Little off the street. They were using Rex Burkhead as a wide receiver. You know, there was never any sense of trade that year. There are clearly teams that would have traded someone, but they decided that they were going to ride with, you know, what they had, which was practice squad guys and, you know, guys who were not on a roster at the beginning of the season. And that just seems to be, you know, what they do, same with, you know, kicker when they finally got rid of Mike Nugent, it wasn't, hey, let's try to trade for a kicker. We'll just grab someone off, you know, who's been on his fifth team in five years with Randy Bullock. We'll go with him. And, yeah, I'd, I'd be very surprised if they were buyers, even if they did turn it around. Now, there's a small chance they could be sellers, but I think the Bengals probably would have a lot of difficulty doing that only because the general – feel you seem to get from different insider comments and tweets and so forth is they tend to ask way too much for what they want in return, which obviously worked out with Carson Palmer. They got two high picks, uh, has not worked out with McCarron because I think they have had, it seems like they've had offers, but the offers have not been nearly high enough. You kind of get some 
you know, little sniffs here and there of what it seems like teams are offering for him, and it sounds like they're reasonable offers, but the Bengals are clearly shooting, you know, holding out for much, much more. So I'd be very surprised just because they don't seem to buy, and when they sell, they, you know, they have this 20-year-old Honda Accord that's worth 2000 bucks, but they are expecting to get, you know, $7,000 for it, despite what Kelly Blue Book says, and that just doesn't seem to, to work unless mm-hmm. Hugh Jackson's in Oakland. Well, obviously, everybody knows about Hugh, the Hugh Jackson trade with uh, Carson Palmer and, and how the Bengals kind of fleeced them at that point, and it netted netted them quite a bit, and it, it changed both franchises uh, quite a bit going forward. I, obviously, that's that's not on the table, and I, I don't. There's, uh, I think the big name that everybody's throwing out is Jeremy Hill. And, and, you know, there's, oh, the Giants need a running back. The Giants need a running back. They're a big market team. Maybe they'll trade for Jeremy Hill. I, I don't see it. I really don't. He's affordable. He's in the last year of his deal for the Bengals. The Bengals have a a track record, especially at the skill positions, an unfortunate track record, which is that they lose them to injury quite quite frequently. And, not that I wish that, but I, I, I just I think at certain positions you got to stand pat. Uh, I'm seeing other people in there, maybe maybe Kevin Minter or Michael Johnson. You know, Michael Johnson's found a nice niche with the Bengals right now, and I don't see him getting traded either. Kevin Minter again, one year deal, playing decent football, nothing great, but kind of a slight upgrade to Ray Maluga as we as we kind of expected with this signing. But I don't see Michael Johnson going now. If Michael Johnson maybe wasn't performing as well as he has as he has been in this new role, then I, I could see him maybe being traded out there as a a veteran kind of former big name type of guy that maybe nets something. But at this point, the only thing the Bengals need to to really trade for is is an offensive lineman, and I don't know where they would get that. Maybe maybe a tight end if they feel that they need someone to really replace Eifert. I, otherwise, I don't I don't really see much that screams trade. I, I I think I think their defensive line has been playing very well, especially in getting to the quarterback. Their linebackers have been doing a decent job. Nick Vigil's been a nice little surprise this year. They've given up the second least amount of total yards on uh, from their defense in team history so far through these first these first uh, five games that they've played. So I, I think defense, how they're playing as a unit, is is fine. I think if there's any any kind of trade out there for an offensive lineman that could come in and start, that would be nice. This team's stubborn, though, especially with guys they draft, and I, I, I don't see them really supplanting immediately supplanting a starter as it is. Now we have seen some shuffling on the offensive line with Andre Smith coming in, so you know they've done it, but usually they're very, very hesitant to pull the plug on certain players, certain starters, and uh, I don't, I don't really see a trade happening at this point, but, but. I think this is one of the years that it very well could happen more so than previous years, if that makes sense. I know that uh, probably is a little contradictory on my part, but uh, we'll 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 find out soon enough because the trade deadline is coming up, and uh, the Bengals, if you know, especially if they remain in the hunt, they win this game against the Steelers, and they see. You know, we're a pretty good team, but if we kind of fix one or two little areas here, they could really do some good things. Scott, any final thoughts before we finish up and get out of here? You got to unmute, my friend. You got to unmute, my friend. You're supposed to be able to hear me through the mute. Use that, uh, Jedi, yeah. you know, use that yeah. Jedi uh, powers to, <laughs> to hear. Well, I can, I can. I can. The li- <laughs> the li- the- I don't know that everybody everybody who's listening is force sensitive. You know what I mean? You're not able to use the force to like extend it, you know, what you can hear out to the rest of the the world. Uh, yep. 
But yeah, it, it will be an interesting change getting back into football gear after taking last week off doing some family stuff of what the hay rides and uh, corn mazes and some different things like that. Uh, I think one, one, two, two players I'll throw out for Steelers players who I think are going to be big keys to the game before we disappear. Uh, one is Joe Hayden, who for whatever reason has always seemed to do, do a good job against A.J. Green is now with the Steelers. There was that thing where the Browns cut him in kind of a surprise move. The Steelers scooped him up. We didn't face him when we were in Cleveland a couple weeks ago. Now we are going to face him. I think he's starting for the Steelers. I think they signed him like three years, $27 million. So we'll probably see plenty of him on A.J. Green. It'll be interesting to see what an older Joe Hayden does against – well, obviously they're both older. but uh, So that'll be an interesting, uh, I guess, one-on-one to see. The other one is – this is a guy, I don't know if our listeners remember, but uh, one of the names I recall during draft time that I think you were hyping up quite a bit, at least a little bit, because he was a USC guy, you're out in California, a guy that I remember you commenting a couple times you thought was pretty good, and now we'll get to face him, is Juju Smith-Schuster. So yeah. it's you know, we've been able to hold Antonio Brown – you know, in check the last couple of years, but it's always that second guy that Martavis Bryant, you know, the or Heath Miller or Jesse James. So this year, be you know, okay. So let's say we bracket or do whatever we're doing to Antonio Brown. We keep that going. We hold him to you know five catches, fifty yards, whatever. Can we then also keep someone like Juju Smith Schuster from you know sneaking behind the secondary and catching some sort of fluky you know fifty yard touchdown pass? So I'm going to throw those out. It's kind of my two kind of key players, the one the USC guy that I know you were high on, and then Joe Hayden, who for whatever reason seems to be the one person who at least to some degree can cover A.J. Green. Juju Smith-Schuster, my, my brother is a local coach and uh, high school teacher. Juju Smith-Schuster visited that campus. Aside from him being a, a good college football player, he visited that campus and was awesome. He was working out there with a number of different pros and other rookies that were coming in and was a was very, very awesome to all of the high school students there. He was taking group pictures and meeting all the students and very friendly. So not only was he a good college football player, he was very friendly with all of the kids at my brother's school, and we kind of had a soft spot for him. Obviously, the Bengals needed some help at wide receiver this year, so they went with John Ross. And Juju Smith-Schuster ended up going to the Steelers. So, obviously, two careers to follow in general. Just two high picks for two rivals and uh, two very good college football players from the Pac-12. So, uh, you know, uh, something to watch there. You know, obviously, this week's about the Bengals and the Steelers. And uh, it's it's a fun week. It's a fun game. And I I've got a couple of final thoughts. Number one is... If you're going to the game and you're a Bengals fan, just be careful. There, I've seen some nasty stuff recently about people sucker punching people in the stands and all that kind of stuff. Just, you know, I understand that football's a, football is an emotional sport for the players, obviously, but the fans get emotional. They get drunk. They get all kinds of stuff. So just be careful and obviously – it's a hated franchise with within the Bengals fan base, but be careful. The other thing I want to say, and this has nothing to do with the Bengals per se, but on Twitter at CJ Anthony CUI, and I hope you do, there's a link in my profile that is for a GoFundMe account. This GoFundMe account is for it will it will go towards scholarships, college scholarships for students in uh, in the community at large, and we are taking donations. The reason why we are taking donations, unfortunately, is I lost my sister in the past week. It was, uh, it's been a very hard time for our family, but I don't want to go into details or anything like that. We're trying to make something positive out of it. And my sister was a Bengals fan and watched a number, countless, countless Bengals games with my brother and I went to Cincinnati with us 
to go see games uh, out in Cincinnati. She lived out, uh, out in Southern California with us. So if you are so inclined, I know many, if, if any at all, probably did not know my sister, but if you are passionate about education or want to support something that's a good cause, go to my Twitter account at CJ Anthony CUI. There is a GoFundMe link there. You can place a donation no matter how small, no matter how large. We've kind of set a goal. We've already, from what I just looked at, we're already halfway there in the first 24 hours of posting it, which is awesome. So we might boost it up and try and get even more support. But if you would like to do that, I would greatly appreciate it. My family would greatly appreciate it. And I know students that we're going to give these this scholarship money to will greatly appreciate it. So go check that out if you can. If you don't follow me on Twitter, or for some reason you don't want to follow me on Twitter, you can go, her name was Lisa Kazenza, and you can go on GoFundMe.com, search for Lisa Kazenza Memorial Fund, and uh, you can find all of the details there. I would greatly appreciate it, and uh, thank you so much. Scott, thanks for dealing with my hectic schedule this past week. I know uh, I've been all over the map, unfortunately, and I just uh, unfortunately had to explain why, but appreciate you dealing with it. I, I hope that uh, the Bengals can pull one out that a lot of people don't seem to think that they can pull pull it out because they don't, they're don't. they pretty hefty underdogs, right? Yeah, I, I'll admit, I we do a weekly, on Cincy Jungle, we do a weekly pick them where the contributors and writers, we all pick who we think we're going to, who's going to win each week. I'll admit last week I picked, well, I guess last week was a bye week. So I did not pick the Bengals to win. Um, that'd be very difficult. The week before I picked them to lose and they won. So <laughs> I have no objection to being wrong if it works in our favor. So I did that again. I picked the Steelers and I sure hope I'm wrong. Uh, I was encouraged to see a lot of their contributors did pick the Bengals, which, you know, you, you would think, uh, well, okay, you know, it's a down year. You know, we're playing on the road, a tough team, a team that we hate playing because they're, you know, for various reasons. Uh, most of the contributors did pick them. I went against them, not because I want them to lose, but, you know, it worked last time. Just like with the jerseys, last few weeks when I wore a jersey of a non-Bengals team, the Bengals were winning. I stopped that last week on the bye week. I guess I did not do that again this week. So we'll see if it pays off if I need to go back to wearing a Browns or an Ohio State jersey or something. <laughs> to yep. Get them back on track. Yep. Yep. Well, what's your what's your score but, prediction? And and uh, we usually do that. And I guess I'm still in bye week brain mode. Uh, what what's your what's your call and score prediction before we get out of here on this game? Now I. Originally would have said I won that uh, behind enemy lines thing that we do with the Steelers and with all the uh, different teams we play each week. They asked me the same question. I went 16-14 with the Steelers winning, uh, like I said, because I had picked them in that uh, you know weekly pick them thing. And it's going to be a very challenging game. And, yeah, I, I picture it being a very defensive back and forth. But I'm going to change my prediction uh, in honor of – obviously it was a horrible loss that – your family had, and I'm going to, I didn't realize your sister was a huge Bengals fan. So I'm going to see if they can pull it out for Lisa. And I'm going to say, I'm going to up it. I'm going to get Bullock the winning touchdown and say seven or winning field goal. I guess. Now that would be something. To watch. <laughs> that would be something to watch. Yeah. Sure, let's I'll, I'll just give him the touchdown. So I was 16, 14, <laughs> 21, 16 Bengals. Randy Bullock scores. Yeah, the ball is miraculously tipped, blocked, tipped back to him. You know, he runs his chubby butt down the field and scores a touchdown. <laughs> Bengals win 20-16. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, you know, I uh, I guess I'm going to go sentimental and think the Bengals win. And by the way, when you say defensive struggle and all of that, I know that's that's code for ugly. That's code for ugly, ugly game. I think we all know that when it comes to football. But um, – uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say, uh, gosh, uh, seven, 17, 14 with, and it's one of those things where the Steelers, the Bengals go up late. The Steelers have the ball at the end and they either have a chance to tie or to go ahead or what have you. And maybe the Bengals hold tight with, uh, some sacks, some quarterback sacks, given 
how they've gotten after the quarterback this year and that, that it maybe would present a, a passing type of situation. So that's our predictions. Hopefully they come true and appreciate everybody tuning in and, and tuning in on a different night. I'm sorry if we interrupted your Thursday night football schedule. So go back, watch some football, have some fun, be safe this weekend. If you are going to the, that game, I'm telling you, uh, it can get a little rowdy, so so be safe if you're going, but have some fun. For Scott Schultz, I'm Anthony Gazenza. This has been the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. We'll see you next time.